Hi, Margaret. Hi, Anand. How are you? I'm great. It's uh, it's fantastic to have you here. Uh, so today my guest is Margaret Brandon. She's the Coleman F. Fung Professor in the School of Engineering and also holds a courtesy affiliation with the Stanford University School of Medicine. Her research focuses on the development of applied mathematical and economic models to support health policy decisions. Her recent work has focused on HIV prevention and treatment programs, programs to control the U.S. opioid epidemic, and policies for minimizing the spread of infectious diseases, including COVID-19. She has served as principal investigator or co-principal investigator on a broad range of funded research projects. She's an INFORMS Fellow and a member of the Omega Rho International Honor Society for OR and Management Science. She received many awards from INFORMS and other institutions. You can find a list on her website. So Margaret, uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It's such a great honor to have you here. Uh, how are you? How are things? Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to share a little bit about my uh, career trajectory with everyone. Yeah, so excellent. You. Uh, so you're on sabbatical, actually. Yes, I am. I'm on sabbatical for the full academic year. Um, you know, with the COVID situation, I'm not sure exactly what I can do. So far, my sabbatical has been spent at home at my desk. Um, <laughs> perhaps things will get better and I'll be able to go somewhere. Yeah. But uh, still, it's nice to be on sabbatical, yeah. even if at home. Yeah, hopefully, yes. Uh, you are currently in California, uh, but you were originally from the East Coast of the U.S., right? That's right. Um, I was born in New York City and lived there till I was about five. And then I lived in various places in the East Coast uh, when I was young uh, until I went to college in Boston. And then um, I came to Stanford as a grad student and have been here ever since. But yes, I, I lived in the East Coast till I was about 22 or 23. Uh huh. Um, I know there's an interesting story behind your surname. Do you mind sharing it? So my last name is Brando. And if you do any kind of Google search, you will see it's a very unusual name. Um, and the reason it's an unusual name is because it's made up. So my real name is Brandau with no E in it, D-A-U. And that's a German name from uh, Hesse, a part of Germany. Um, and my grandfather, who was born in the United States, was named Brandau. And he was studying at the Sorbonne in Paris right before World War I was about to break out. And he didn't want people to think he was German. So he thought, well, I'll stick an E in my name and make it French. So he changed our name from Brandau to Brando. And so my father was born Brando. But another interesting thing about my surname, and Brandau, in fact, is a uh, not a common name at all in Germany. Uh, another interesting thing is that the actor Marlon Brando is also, his family was also originally named Brandau. And when they came to the US, their name got changed to D-O-W, Brandau. And then the W got dropped and they became Brando. So in different ways, we both became Brando from our name Brandau. Yeah. So um, that's kind of interesting when you have an unusual name. It's easy to track your history. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, very interesting story. Your dad was a very clever person. Tell me more about him. Uh, so my dad grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and he was very smart. And then uh, World War II came. So he enlisted. And but he was very, very smart. So he enlisted in the US Navy. So the Navy, instead of sending him off to combat, sent him to MIT to train as an engineer because they knew they needed engineers. So he was like a midshipman in the US Navy. Uh, and, and he was went to MIT and studied electrical engineering. Uh, then he, he got his bachelor's and his master's degree in electrical engineering, paid for it by the US Navy. Then it happened, the war was over. And so uh, he really didn't have to do much more service. And he had two degrees from MIT. <laughs> then he decided that uh, he would go to law school. Uh, he was interested in patent law. So he went to Harvard Law School and became a patent lawyer. 
And then he decided he needed to know a little bit about business. So he went to Harvard Business School uh, and um, be, just to learn more about business as a patent lawyer. So yes, uh, highly educated. Wow, wow. And I will add, so I'm one of six children. When my dad went to Harvard Business School, he had six children. Wow. And he worked at night as a patent lawyer to support us. Yeah. So very smart and accomplished and hardworking. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Uh, what about your mom? I know she's still alive. Uh, yes, my mom is 95 years old and going strong, still, still wants to be my mother <laughs> and tell me, you know, things I need to do. Uh -huh. So yeah, she's still going strong. Um, yeah, uh, so back in the day, uh, you know, women didn't really work. So my mom, you know, she had six children, didn't really work. But then when we were growing up, she became a real estate agent and then a real estate broker and then a real estate appraiser. And she didn't retire until she was about 75. So extremely full of energy and vigor. Um, and uh, so now she's 95, lives out here near me. <laughs> right. Uh, so how was life growing up in the 60s in a house full of books and siblings? Uh, well, let's see. So there were six of us. I'm number two in the lineup. Um, although I will say my older sister is a very easygoing person and I'm much more the organizer. So I tended to be more the dominant, like older child in a way. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was great. You know, our house was like the fun house on the block. Every kid came over to play at our house. Because I remember distinctly my younger uh, brother, uh, who's number four in the lineup, a friend came over and he said to my mom, Mrs. Brando, is John home? My mom said, no. And he said, is Greg home? That's the brother who's three years younger. No. Is Louise home? That's the sister who's two years younger than that. So you'd come over to my house and just look for somebody to play with. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so we just had a total great time growing up. We did lots of things. We, uh, Our mom bought a camp trailer and a boat and put the camp trailer on the back of the car and we camped up and down the eastern seaboard. My dad didn't usually come because he had to work, but my mom's like, well, we're all going camping, so everybody help. And so it was really fun having a large family um, with, you know, somebody always to play with and do things with. And even now that we're grown up, we're all still really close. So yeah. I think that's a nice thing. Yeah, that's great. And you mentioned about the books. So when we were growing up, our parents wouldn't let us have a television. They thought that it would be better to read books and learn things. So I remember distinctly when uh, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, we had to go to the neighbor's house to watch it on TV because we didn't have a TV. Mm. Uh, but on the plus side, our house was just filled with books and we all just read every book there is. And it, to say nothing of playing and doing things and being creative. So um, I still love reading to this day. Mm -hmm. Any author you were particularly fond of? Um, you know, back then, I think two of my favorite authors were Charles Dickens. I really like his witty, discursive, descriptive style. But more than that, I like the fact that he was a uh, he was advocating for change. He was advocating for social justice. Uh, for example, no child labor, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I really love Charles Dickens. And, um, you know, I remember I, I love Dostoevsky a lot. That's a totally different type of yeah. thing. Very much darker and grimmer in a way, uh -huh. yet also deals with important philosophical questions of life. Yeah. So um, I like many, many authors, but those are two, at least from back then, that I really enjoyed. It could be just because that's what was on my parents' bookshelf, <laughs> but I really loved them. Yeah, and before going to university, you thought of being a novelist. Yes, so um, I, I didn't have any kind of career plan at all beyond just studying what's interesting, but I've always loved to read and write and I just thought, wouldn't it be great to be a writer? So when I was, and I also loved math. So when I was going to college, I thought, well, there's two things that I particularly like, and that is reading and writing and that sort of thing, and mathematics. And so I was sort of veering between um, a, a more humanistic 
uh, undergraduate education versus uh, studying perhaps mathematics or some combination of the two, it ended up that I went to MIT because my parents said to me, you, you can always write anytime, but it's a little harder to teach yourself mathematics. And so if you go to MIT and study math, you, you will at least learn that. And it happened that when I went to MIT, I, I did take a lot of math classes, but I also took a lot of humanities classes. Oh. And so I was actually able to um, sort of satisfy both. Right. And you even won the annual writing contest in a particular category at MIT. I did. I did. When I was, uh, uh, they have an annual M uh, Boyd writing contest at MIT, and uh, I won it for best piece of fiction. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Although I never, I never did become a novelist, unless you count the descriptive phrases in my journal articles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, your brother, one of your brothers also went to MIT, correct? That's right. My uh, one of my younger brothers went to MIT and um, was an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. Or actually, he was really a computer scientist, but at the time, electrical engineering and computer science were the same department. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And what was the average percentage of women in the classes you attended? So when I went to MIT, my undergraduate class overall was twelve percent female, um, and then. I was a math major, which was like a few percent female. There were just a couple of us. Um, so not very many at all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you did not put your first name in tests and so on, right? So uh, in the math major, there were not very many women at all. And by the way, I never ever had a woman math or science professor. But anyway, um, there were very few women and everybody knew who you were. I mean, at least your face. So when I would s s put enter uh, uh, my name on a test or a homework, I would just put M Brando and not Margaret, just as a way to just be treated like everyone else. And I thought that was completely fine. You know, just it's a pragmatic way to avoid um, attention, positive or negative. I thought that was just uh, a better way to fit in. Right. So you were sort of aware of the issue, but yet you just decided to, uh, you know, be objective and uh, take that that decision to to make things practical. Yes. I mean, I never felt that I didn't belong. My dad had gone to MIT, mm -hmm. so I never thought at all that I didn't belong there. I always knew it was a great place and I could do well there. But just pragmatically, I thought there's so few women. I mean, my dad told me in his class at MIT, which was around like 1949, um, there was one woman. Wow. You know, so at least we had 12% in our class, so it was yeah. getting better. Yeah. But still, I just thought that it was better to be judged for my work and not for my name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how was your first experience with OR? Uh, well, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I took a couple of classes called Principles of Applied Mathematics. I think one was discrete mathematics and the other was continuous. And I learned about uh, combinatorial optimization. And I thought, well, that's a really interesting math problem. You know, like, for example, um, you know, why can't you color a map in, in fewer than four colors? Or how do you efficiently sort a list of numbers? And so I thought those were really interesting math problems. And then I found out that had a name and it was called operations research. At MIT, they did not have a department of operations research. They had a program sort of interdisciplinary. So I didn't know about it. But so I took these classes and I found out that there was a thing called operations research and that I had already done about half of the master's degree when I was taking classes as an undergraduate. So then I, um, applied for the masters like co-terminal masters in operations research and took the additional classes but again it was sort of i didn't know what it was called i just thought it was interesting stuff <laughs> and so that's kind of how i became an operations researcher started in math realized i like applied math and realized i particularly like applied math in the area that operations research focuses on right uh you had a math professor that encouraged you at some point too right so um, I ha at MIT, you have to do a master's 
thesis. And so I was doing a master's thesis and my advisor, so I was an undergrad, I was just doing co-terminal and he, he didn't really know me that well, except I was doing this thesis. And he said, oh, um, I, I told him I was an undergrad getting a master's. He said, I thought you were a PhD student. I said, no, I, um, I don't think I would get a PhD unless I became a professor. And he looked at me really seriously and said, so? And I said, well, I don't think I'd want to be a professor unless I could be a professor at a top school. And he said to me, so? And it totally, a light bulb went off in my head. I did not realize that I had the potential to do that. Nobody in my family was a professor. I just couldn't see that. But my advisor is like, you could totally be a professor at a top school if you wanted to. He ended up being right. Although even then I wasn't sure. It just put the idea in my head. Yeah. So, and, and we're still good friends at Stick Larson at MIT. Uh, and we're still good friends. And uh, I've told him in the past how much his uh, inspiring words, you know, got me to thinking about where I could go well, and what I could do. Amazing. Yeah. By talking to you, I could uh, realize you have m uh, multiple abilities and skills and you were a person in, interested in many subjects and activities. Uh, can you list some of them? Well, do you mean scholarly subjects or otherwise? Everything. Well, okay, so scholarly, I, I've always been interested in math uh, and in humanities, in reading, writing. I speak French and I speak Spanish and I've taken a number of classes in those. Um, I think more broadly, uh, I really, I have many hobbies and activities. Um, I love to travel. I travel a lot. And I'd love to visit you in Brazil, maybe sometime when COVID is over. We'll yeah, see about that. That'll be wonderful. Um, but really enjoy traveling. And I've been all over the world and very much enjoyed it. I did a great sabbatical in Geneva working for United Nations AIDS program one year. That was fun. So that's one of my interests. I also uh, enjoy swimming. I'm a pretty serious swimmer. I swim every other day, 2000 yards. Wow. Uh, this week, I'm going swimming up in San Francisco Bay with a couple of friends. So I uh, really enjoy water sports and swimming and sailing and all that stuff. And then at my home, I love gardening. I have a very large vegetable and fruit garden. And I'm also a beekeeper. So I love to be outdoors more broadly. And I also enjoy hiking. My son and I have gone on a number of walking holidays in Europe. Uh, so I enjoy many different things, uh, outdoor activities, sports, gardening, um, yeah, to say that, nothing of, I still enjoy reading. Yeah. That's amazing. Very impressive. Uh, so coming back to your masters, uh, what did you do? Uh, so I had to do a master's thesis and my master's thesis was about control of interline subway systems. So the basic idea is that let's say you're in Boston and you, you need to go from point A to point B, but you have to switch from the green line to the blue line. So you take the green line to government center, or maybe it's the red line. I forget which color. Anyway, you take the green line to government center and you need to get the next train on the other line. So you walk down the escalator to the next line and wait for the next train. Well, the, what I observe sometimes is that, you know, dozens of people would walk down the steps just to see an empty train leaving. And so the question is, should you hold the train and for how long if you have information about when the next train is coming? So what I did is I went and I observed the subway. I observed the inter-arrival times of each of the uh, lines at one of the stations to get a sense of what the probability distribution is. And then I looked at um, uh, how much of a hold should you have if you have probabilistic information about when the next train will be arriving. So that was my master's thesis. Right. So you were, you were there uh, holding a stopwatch or something and collecting the data? Yes. Or Yes, I just sat on a bench there trying to look inconspicuous and and with a little piece of paper and just wrote down, you know, 432, 436, 438, which train arrived. And of course, on a particular line, 
there are several different trains, depend, sometimes depending on what the terminus is. Yes. So I collected all that information. I fitted some probability distributions and then worked out some math about when you should hold trains. Right. And how much better you could do if you did that or uh -huh. not. Uh, so after completing the master's, you did not go straight to the PhD. Yes, I worked for a company run by my advisor, Dick Larson, and a couple of other professors called Public Systems Evaluation. And it was a nonprofit public sector consulting company in Cambridge. And it was maybe seven people worked there, like the four professors, two worker bees, and an administrative assistant. An interesting thing is that the other so-called worker bee was uh, Ed Kaplan, who's now a professor at Yale. Wow. Uh, but we both were interested in public systems. And so that's how we got there. And I, in that job, I did a very interesting project. My project was to help the city of Boston think about how to deploy their ambulances. And in particular, where the home bases for the ambulances should be. Um, at the time, the ambulance service of Boston had been on the front page of the Boston Globe in the expose column for about a month. And, you know, uh, you know, dirty ambulances, ambulances take forever to arrive, drivers will rob you. I mean, lots of, apparently lots of problems. And so the commissioner of health and human services said, we need to fix this problem. And one of the things they thought about was, well, we need to make them operationally more efficient. So my advisor, Dick Larson, through our company, got this, this um, contract, I think, or grant to figure out where the home bases for the ambulances should be. Like, should we move some of those home bases from where they are so that the system would be more efficient? So that was uh, the project that one of the projects that I worked on. Quite interesting. Yeah, right. Uh, you, you actually uh, wrote a book chapter uh, as a result of that uh, work, but it took about seven years or so to be published. Yes. So um, a, a colleague at Yale was uh, creating an edited book about public sector applications of operations research. So I had written up a paper describing the work because I think if you do something interesting, you should share it with people. Um, so I wrote this book chapter and we submitted it and they liked it very much. But it, what with one thing and another, and I don't even know how or why, it took seven years from the time we did that work until the time that book appeared in print. Um, but it's still a really good book chapter. And I think it's the first published piece of work that I ever wrote. I, it's not the first piece of work I ever published because it took seven years, but I know <laughs> yeah. for sure it was the first thing I ever wrote. Yeah. And during that period is, is when you attended a conference for the first time, I think the ARSA conference in the late 70s. Yes. So because my uh, boss at the company or my advisor was a professor, we uh, would take our work and, and uh, presented it what at the times was ORSA and TIMS, the ORSA and TIMS conferences. So the first conference I went to was approximately 1978 in New Orleans, and it was the ORSA conference. So we traveled down to New Orleans and I gave a talk about the, uh, about the work we had done. It was interesting because back then, the, now this definitely is going to date me, but um, the, the talk you would give was with transparencies on a uh, projector. So you'd have some transparencies that you'd written out by hand, you'd put it on the projector, and you'd talk about it, and then you put up the next transparency. So it was it was fun and interesting. Mm. I, I enjoyed it very much. Were there many uh, female attendees there? No, I don't think so. My recollection is that there were very, very few women at the conference, and most of them were like military uh, officers who had been assigned to go there. Most of the women were you know, in uniform, so presenting military operations research. There were a few women scholars, very few. And uh, from that meeting and for the next, you know, five or 10 years, when we would see each other at conferences at the 
ORSA or Tim's conferences, we'd sort of make an appointment to go to one of the conference rooms with a sandwich for lunch. <laughs> so there were a group of maybe eight or 10 women who just kind of thought, hey, why don't we have lunch together? That has since turned into women in ORMS where the Worms group where now, in fact, they have enormous lunches for a couple hundred people. And, yeah. and it's a, actually hard to get tickets to. Yeah. So, so it's grown into a really nice thing. Wow. Um, eventually you decided to do a PhD and you went west, but why? Well, um, I'd already gotten my first two degrees at uh, MIT and I thought, I don't think it's a good idea to stay at the same place forever. It's a good idea to see something different. And so uh, Stanford was well known for having good operations research. So I just thought, well, I will go there and move out to California and go to a new place, which actually ended up being a really fantastic thing because in the PhD program, I met my husband who was a fellow PhD student um, and I grew to really love California. I still live here. So <laughs> kind of ended up being a good thing in the Markov um, world that you could call it the trapping state. Mm -hmm. I came out to Stanford and never left. Yeah. So <laughs> my Markov trapping state node. Yeah. But you did your entire PhD without grant. Yes. So um, I came to a department at Stanford called Engineering Economic Systems, which uh, is no longer a department. It's sort of merged with a couple of others to make the current department I'm in, Management Science and Engineering. But uh, EES, that's the abbreviation for that department, did not really have almost any PhD student funding. So the whole time I was a graduate student, I worked at Stanford Medical Center doing planning for the hospital and medical school, which ended up being kind of a good thing. The person I was working with, David Hopkins, actually has a PhD in operations research from Stanford and has won the Lanchester Prize. So very distinguished and really knows operations research. So he was a great guy to work for. And we just did lots of practical prop. Uh, projects at the hospital and medical school, which actually led to a couple of good publications. Mm -hmm. Like we published a paper about patient mix modeling using linear programming to think about the mix of patients given the resources you have and how if you get, uh, you want to say renovate your hospital and have different mix of resources, how can your patient mix change? Um, we wrote another paper that's in operations research, I believe, about medical school financial planning. So it ended up being sort of a side gig, but but an interesting one where I published some papers. Yeah, very profitable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but what was the exact topic of your PhD research? Uh, my PhD research was about uh, network lo location modeling, lo uh, modeling the facility location and with a bit of a network flavor. So um, basically just math. Mm -hmm. And uh, I managed to get a number of publications out of it. It was kind of interesting, um, but it sort of ended up not exactly being my life's work at all. It was more a mm -hmm. pragmatic thing. I had been working with an advisor in our department uh, who left Stanford at the end of my second year. We were doing some work around medical decision making. So uh, at the end of the second year now, I don't have a thesis advisor or a thesis topic. So one of my friends from MIT, Operations Research Faculty, uh, Operations Research Center, joined our faculty, that's Sam Chu, and so I said to him, uh, do you know any good problems I can solve? Maybe when you did your thesis, were there problems you didn't solve? So that was how my PhD thesis came about. It was looking at problems in a particular area where I could use mathematics and solve the problems. <laughs> so kind of a pragmatic, pragmatic approach exactly. to finishing the PhD. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. yeah. Uh... And then you, you got your PhD degree uh, after five years. Yes. Right. Uh, and then you applied for a position at Stanford itself. Yes. So um, I was actually never planning to be a professor at all. And I was thinking 
like with the operations research background, maybe I could go work for American Airlines and help schedule the airplanes, things like that. So uh, I'm near the, I'm in winter quarter of my last year and my advisor said, you know, there's a position in another department at Stanford, which was industrial engineering department. Um, and they weren't able to fill it last year. Why don't you apply for it? And I was like, I don't know, you know, I'm not thinking of being a professor. So my advisor said, it's only one day of your time. You can always say no. So I'm like, okay, I'll apply. So, <laughs> so I, I applied to the position. And again, I spent a day, you know, interviewing, meeting people. And then it happened, they offered me the position and said, you know, you're our first choice. So then I thought, well, I could try this for a few years and see if it's any good. But again, I wasn't like totally sold on being an academic at all, but I thought I would try it. Well, after a couple of years in, I realized I found, at least for me, the best job ever. So I uh, just absolutely love being a professor, love the um, intellectual freedom, yeah. the autonomy. Um, so it ended up being a good thing that my advisor made me do it. Yeah, and so I've been at Stanford yeah. ever since. Yeah, and intellectual freedom uh, is an expression that I use here uh, when I talk why I like my work. Uh, liberdade intelectual, we say in Portuguese. Exactly the same uh, expression you use, I, I also uh, use here. Uh, But I, I will say another thing, which is that, as I say, I never thought of being a professor at all. And honestly, I wrote journal articles because it's, I like to write. <laughs> Hopefully they're not too novelistic and they're factual, but um, I think it's a good idea if you do some research to share it with people, share your, the knowledge you've obtained. And so when I finished my PhD, I had like seven or eight publications. Wow. And again, it wasn't to be a professor, it was just because I think you should publish and share. And frankly, the refereeing process is a way to make sure your papers are good and help make them stronger. Not always, but we hope. Yeah. So even though I wasn't really thinking of being a professor, in hindsight, I realized I was exactly suited to be a professor because I like to do research and write papers. So after a couple of years in my job, I realized, oh, okay. I see, it all fits. I, I should be a professor. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. The, the, the story that how things, uh, you know, turn out to be really uh, positive for you. And it was not probably your plan A, but uh, it, it turned out really well. Uh, you got married and had three kids. The first two were born before you had got the tenor position. How did you manage maternity and work? Um, well, I think uh, it's very simple to say I worked really hard, really hard. Um, we had a live-in au pair, which was very helpful, and the au pair would watch the children from eight to five every day. So I'd get up, give people breakfast, and then the au pair would take over at 8 a.m., and then no matter what, I had to be home at 5 p.m. so the au pair could have time off. Um, And at the time, my husband, he was pretty busy and he was working in Silicon Valley. So it, would, it wasn't at all reasonable to think he could be home at five. But, but that's fine. As a professor, you have much more flexibility. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would then give the children dinner, work till about nine. And then often I would work from nine to midnight. But the thing is, I said, to, so I was basically in some ways doing two full-time jobs. But I said to myself, I chose both of these paths. I really like both paths. I really want to be with my children and be a good mother. And I really want to be a scholar. So in the years leading up to tenure, I just worked incredibly hard. And I think the second thing is you have to be focused. There's no more of these long lunches where you chat, uh, sadly. <laughs> you got to be focused. You got to say, I have to go to the office. The other thing I did is I worked out three or four days a week in the swimming pool. And again, you have to be incredibly disciplined and say, okay, this is my swim time. I don't have time for lunch with you. And then when I'm done swimming, I have to get to the office and meet that student. So you have to be very focused. And so, yeah, it was seven years of extremely hard work, but I don't regret it at all. Yeah, and you really worked hard for uh, that tenure position and even set up a challenge of writing uh, a paper to, to be submitted to OR alone as a single author? Well, uh, so 
I did some things that I think are strategic and I, I think it's a good idea, which is, so I was one of the first women faculty members in the School of Engineering, like maybe the fourth or fifth, something like that. And I already got my PhD at Stanford. And so the natural question is, well, you know, of all the papers you wrote with her advisor, how much is your work? And so you want to distinguish yourself and show that you can do yeah, good right. things yourself. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, um, the good way to do that would be to write a sole author paper in operations research. So it was a very pragmatic decision. So I said to myself, what math problem can I solve that I could try to publish in operations research? So I took this facility location problem that was deterministic and I worked it out in the stochastic sense. So I just made the whole problem stochastic and worked out all the math. So I submitted this paper to operations research. It got accepted. It's a very nice paper. Now, to get back to the practical aspect. So I did this because I wanted to, um, you know, just have a sole author paper in operations research. It was not my most impactful work. I think that paper's been cited 12 times. <laughs> Although, feel free to cite it, Anand, okay? Um, sure. But I did it for a practical reason, which is to show hey, I too can write papers in operations research. So I think that's a good tip for people coming up for tenure is sometimes you gotta do what's practical. Like you know what the tenure criteria are, so make sure that you are sort of uh, checking the boxes of what you need to do. Anyway, so my friend has a joke, another professor at Stanford, he said, I'm gonna cite you, I'm going to say, this work is nothing like the work of Brando, cite. <laughs> But no, only 12 citations so far. Yeah. But, you know, you do what you have to do. Yeah, and I just, I, I think being pragmatic is a good thing. That's a very good piece of advice. Uh, I think many people appreciate that. Uh, but eventually you decided to switch topics completely. You decided to uh, focus your research on drug abuse and then HIV. Can you tell me more about how was the process of, you know, changing fields? So I was... Uh, in the industrial engineering department, working in the area of kind of network modeling and logistics. Um, I want to brag a little. I have a patent at Hewlett Packard for how to set up printed circuit board assembly machines. I saw that in your website. <laughs> so basically doing standard manufacturing logistics types of problems, a little more math flavored with networks and all. But um, And so I didn't have tenure yet. I was still assistant professor. But one of my students, whose husband was the chairman of the Stanford Department of Medicine, she was an older person coming back to school, said, you know, I'd love to do a master's thesis or an engineer's thesis on AIDS. And, and you know, uh, I think we could get some funding. Would you be interested? And we could, you know, examine policies. So I actually said something that was really one of the, in hindsight, one of the smarter things I've said, which is, I will not do this research unless we get a medical collaborator because I don't know enough. So uh, her husband found us this um, postdoctoral scholar, a physician who was getting a master's degree in health services research to work with me and the student. Um, well, many years later, he is now a chaired full professor at Stanford, as am I, and we're still working together. But it was really a great idea to work with a domain expert and I truly feel that the work we could do together is far more than the, the work either of us could do alone but to get back to the uh, assistant professor situation so I just decided I was going to do this and my department chair at the time said you know this is a very risky strategy you could just stick with the manufacturing and then people would you know you could get tenure and I said you know what I don't care. I want to do this. And if people like it, good. If they don't, that's okay. So so I just basically took a, a, a turn into public policy and disease modeling. So using operations research and mathematical methods to look at health policy. And we started with HIV. And so we did this work uh, maybe for about eight or 10 years with grants from the state of California to look at um, the HIV problem in California. And then we realized we could get bigger grants from NIH with a broader focus. So we 
applied to NIH for grants. And then we've been funded by actually National Institute on Drug Abuse mm -hmm. ever since then. Uh, at the beginning, it was very hard to convince the proposal reviewers of the worth of using operations, research, analytics, and mathematics to inform HIV policy. Yeah. But eventually we won them over and now we're on our fourth large NIH grant. Each one is five years. So, so that was sort of the origin though. It was my student who wanted to do this. And then I had the, the, the sort of in, intuition that you really should work with someone uh, from medicine as well. And so I, we started work on this and then um, I came up for tenure and luckily got tenure. <laughs> and then I, I basically stopped working in the logistics area. And now my work is entirely in areas related to disease control, public health, control of the opioid epidemic, control of drug epidemics. Yeah. So really much more in the public sector. Right, you were a member of the Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council since 2018. And that's thanks to your extensive work on, you know, HIV prevention and treatment programs and so on. Uh, what are the main findings of all of this research you've done in the last 30 years or so? Well, first of all, there is no one HIV epidemic. All HIV epidemics are local. I mean, yes, there's a HIV pandemic globally, but really when you think about prevention, treatment, other things, you got to think about the specific setting. So when you think about uh, HIV in sub-Saharan Africa, it's primarily heterosexually transmitted. Uh, and that's a very low resource setting. So for example, we recently published a study showing that um, if you uh, treat HIV infected patients with antidepressants, assume if they're depressed, you will get much, much better health outcomes. They will adhere to their medications, show up for their appointments, achieve viral suppression, and help reduce the spread of the virus as well as them living longer. So that's an example of a problem in one setting. Another example would be uh, we had a study showing uh, the cost effectiveness of pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, which is you take a daily pill called Truvada as a way of preventing acquiring HIV. And we, we assess the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness in men who have sex with men and in people who inject drugs, so two different studies, showing that it can be effective, but it's very expensive. So there's no one answer to what your, our findings are. It really depends on the specific setting and the specific question. Right. Not for HIV. Yeah. Now, for um, we're, we're also working in the area of, of opioid mm -hmm. modeling. So you may or may not know that the U.S. is in the grip of a very severe opioid crisis. Um, and this has been exacerbated hugely by COVID in the past year because um, people are... Uh, you know, struggling mentally and emotionally and financially. So there's more drug use. But in addition, there's um, less access to treatment because of social distancing and other things, people couldn't get treatment. So in the past year, in 2020, there were 90,000 uh, opioid deaths in the United States. Wow. That was, I believe, 20% more than the previous year. So colossal. The other thing that has happened is that we have the spread of fentanyl, which has appeared in the opioid supply and is far more deadly. So, so a very severe opioid crisis. So working with two different students, we published two different studies about, well, what should we do about the US opioid epidemic? So we looked at 11 different policies that have been considered by policymakers. So for example, as you might expect, reducing prescribing, we, we had better do that. Mm -hmm. um, but also safe disposal programs. If you have some leftover opioid pills, maybe uh, you, you should have a safe place to dispose of them. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting side note here. So I was doing this study with a student. 
I realized I was driving around with a uh, a bottle of oxycodone, the, the, the pills, in the back seat of my car. Really? Why is that? The reason is my mother had had some surgery, uh -huh. and they gave her some oxycodone pills, and. Uh, then it happened, she had to go to the hospital for follow-up and they said, well, you can't take the oxycodone anymore. So they handed me the prescription jar to take away because mm -hmm. they hadn't prescribed it. My mom had it. Mm -hmm. So I just threw it in the back seat of my car because I've got to dispose of it <laughs> driving around with that thing for two months. Anyway, so, yeah. um, so if you have fewer pills out there, there's less to be diverted. Anyway, so, so that's another example, safe disposal. So we looked at 11 different policies. And the policies sort of fall in two main areas, prevention and treatment. So prevention is fewer, pres less prescribing, less diversion, computerized databases to monitor prescriptions. And then treatment is things like um, getting people drug abuse treatment. And we looked at various forms of that. Right. So yeah. our both of our studies really had a couple of main findings, which can sort of broadly be summarized as the following. In the short term, prevention programs, if you cut back on prescribing, that's going to have some negative consequences. If there are fewer opioid pills, people who are addicted either to prescribed or diverted unprescribed pills may escalate to drug injection because heroin tends to be easy to come by and heroin and possibly fentanyl is far more deadly. So in the short term, when you cut back on the supply of pills, there's going to be some negative consequences of more people dying. But of course, in the long term, you have to do that. So the second, so the corollary to that is that if you cut back on the drugs that are out there, you need to scale up treatment. You, you can't just say, oh, sorry, no more pills. You have to say, <laughs> yeah. there are no more pills and we really need to get you into drug treatment. Um, so that's the second thing. The third thing is if you want to prevent deaths from overdose, by far the most effective way is naloxone. Naloxone is the overdose rescue medication. And uh, there are various ways, like many, many police officers in the US carry naloxone in their uh, vehicles with them. Um, and if somebody is overdosing, it's a way to possibly reduce the overdose and keep them from dying. Now, this doesn't solve the problem. This just keeps the person from dying. Um, so that's another interesting point. And then the last thing is, even if we, we cut back on prescribing and we, re, we increase treatment availability, it's not going to have a few, huge effect anytime soon. And there are still going to be many, many deaths. So kind of depressing, but we still have to do this. So that's some of our recent work about controlling the U.S. opioid epidemic. Yeah. And the first paper on this we published in American Journal of Public Health a couple years ago. And then the updated study that reflects COVID and fentanyl uh, is uh, just now coming out in the journal Lancet Regional Health. So interesting uh, studies that do have some higher level insights. Absolutely. This very, very interesting work. Thank you so much for sharing with uh this much level of details. Uh, many people will uh, enjoy uh, listening to that for sure. Uh, let's go a little bit technical. Uh, what OR methodologies do you usually use when conducting research in the context of health policy decisions? So we use a variety of techniques. Um, I'm kind of model agnostic. I think you develop the model you need for the problem. So, but I would say typically we are using nonlinear dynamic systems because that's how you model an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And we are often using optimization, not always. So sometimes we'll um, do a simulation study of an epidemic and then we'll try different policies and see, you know, which policies are the best. So that's just really simulation modeling, although you have to do it carefully. In more theoretical studies, we might look at, uh, well, here's an epidemic model. Can can you tell, give me some insights about how you should allocate limited vaccines? Uh, so that would be a dynamic systems problem with some optimization added to it. Uh -huh. But I would say those are the, the sort of the main techniques is um, optimization, 
dynamic systems, simulation. And then for some studies, we also use a fair amount of data analytics mm. as needed. Right, right. So yeah, uh, many ingredients from OR, OR uh, yeah. methods, that's nice. Uh, you also did uh, research involving other diseases such as hepatitis and anthrax, uh, the latter in the context of uh, bioterrorism. Uh, yes. And, and, you know, after so many years working with models to support health policy decisions, what did you learn that can be applied to address the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, well, one thing I learned is that the reason you're doing the analytics is really to gain insights into good decisions. You can never model anything perfectly. So my medical collaborator that I've worked with for years, Doug Owens, he always says to me, hey, I'm just a dumb physician. You have to tell me the, the key insights of this study. And I'm like, you may be a dumb physician, but you could save my life. <laughs> but but he did teach me that you when you do a study, you really wanna just, just have a few key points about what your study, at least a practical study, what it tells you about how to make good decisions. And that's something we've applied to COVID. So we are doing a number of studies related to COVID right now. We, uh, so I was on the National Academy of Medicine Committee on al Equitable Allocation of the Coronavirus Vaccine. So the US government wanted to know when we have our scarce co coronavirus vaccine, who should get it? So I was on the committee that looked at how to allocate the vaccine. Wow. And one of the things that uh, I realized when on the committee is you kind of have two competing objectives. One objective is to reduce deaths, but one objective is to uh, reduce the spread of the virus. And the reason they're competing objectives is because if you wanna reduce deaths, you need to just vaccinate older people who are gonna die if they get COVID. Now, these are not the people who are spreading COVID, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna reduce the spread of COVID, you need to vaccinate young people. And so we did some theoretical work that was uh, recently came out in mathematical biosciences about how you should allocate vaccines when you have different objectives. We use COVID as an example, but it's not a COVID specific analysis. Um, so th that was an interesting problem. Then we've done some more practical studies. We published a study about the effectiveness of face masks in reducing the spread of COVID, um, which was a sort of a practical simulation type study where we fitted our model to data from an outbreak. Um, then we did another interesting project about um, predicting COVID spread in Israel in the next seven days. So we had lots and lots of COVID data from Israel and we had cell phone data from 3 million, cell phone mobility data from 3 million Israeli phone users, obviously completely anonymized. But our idea was, can we combine information about what's happening with the epidemic with information about mobility patterns to predict the spread of COVID? So that was sort of a machine learning study that my student carried out. So we've done a real variety of uh, projects on COVID. Oh, and then one more that's really quite interesting. Uh, one of my students looked at COVID in prisons. You may not know this, but some of the worst outbreaks of COVID in the US have been in prisons and jails, not in nursing homes, in prisons and jails. And so the question is, um, what interventions are, effect, are effective in reducing the spread of COVID in prisons and jails. So we got data from Cook County Jail in Illinois, which is a very large jail in Chicago, on various interventions they tried and their COVID cases over time. And my student fitted an epidemic model to find out which interventions were useful. And he actually showed that several interventions that had not been recommended necessarily by the CDC were in fact, that the jail implemented were in fact very uh, influential in reducing the spread of COVID in that jail. So that was decarceration. That's letting out low level people out of jail just mm -hmm. because uh, low level offenders, just because, you know, fewer yeah. people. Uh, single selling, 
letting people have their own cell if you have the room and daily asymptomatic testing of people or not daily, but frequent asymptomatic mm -hmm. testing of people. So that's another interesting COVID study. So lots and lots of interesting COVID questions we can address. Yeah. And we recently finished a study about um, uh, using, again, detailed large scale data from Israel about um, the side effects of the booster shot, the third vaccine that they use Pfizer there. Uh -huh. yeah. So a range of, of projects all dealing with very important and timely yeah, questions. Absolutely fascinating, Margaret. I'm really impressed by this uh, large body of work you're doing on the topic. Uh, of course, COVID-19, it's, it's really uh, devastating thing for humanity but you're being again pragmatic and uh you know making use of the situation and doing a lot of lot of uh good research relevant work and you know uh, i hope the results of those findings also bring some you know enlightenment uh to those that take decisions you know public decisions and so on um that's that's uh, that's amazing work now let's switch topics again uh let's talk about your very interesting paper entitled, Who are the Gatekeepers? An Examination of Diversity in Informs Journal Editorial Boards. Tell me the story behind that article. Okay, well, um, when Pinar Kiskinajak was the president of Informs a couple years ago, she instituted uh, a program called Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Ambassadors. And the idea was that people would apply to be an ambassador and have a project aimed at diversity, equity, and inclusion in informs very broadly speaking. And you'd get a small amount of money and you'd carry out a project. An example would be, I'm gonna go to uh, minority high schools in my city and talk about operations research and I need a little bit of funding to support this. So um, there was a call for proposals and of course I did not apply because I don't have time. But then Dinar called me up and said, you know, I think there's a really good project that should be done examining editorial board diversity in our journals. And I think it should be done by a, a rather senior scholar, you know, someone who has a little bit of uh, insight. So why don't you do it? I, of course, said, I don't have any time. And she said, just find a student to help you. Isn't that always the answer? <laughs> anyway. So I agreed to take on this project. Um, and so I found a student who's actually a high school student who lives next door to me in my home. High school student? Me. Yeah, high school student. I will say he's now a freshman at MIT majoring in math. So um, he was a very smart high school student. Wow, but anyway, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I found a student to help me with this project. He was looking for a summer internship and I said, fine, let's do this project. So that was how the project began. And what we did in this project is um, we looked at two measures of diversity. So there are, uh, at the time, were 16 editorial, 16 informed journals and approximately 500 editors collectively. This is like editor and associate editor, what, or department editor, whatever. So about 500 people. So we did two things. One, we examined just demographic measures of diversity. We examined uh, like male or female, um, whether the person is a minority as defined by the US uh, government minority definition, which I cannot repeat exact details here because <laughs> I won't get it right. Yeah, but no problem. Yeah. using the US government definition, we looked at what institution the people were from. So that's an example of just diversity of people. But then, we wanted to also think about diversity of ideas. Well, now diversity of people and diversity of ideas are not the same thing. For example, you could have diverse people with very diverse ideas or you could have diverse people with the same ideas, right? right. So, but nonetheless, we thought let's, let's look at diversity of ideas maybe. And we used a proxy for this because obviously you can't ask people, what are your ideas? <laughs> so our proxy was, have you written a paper with another editor of the journal? So our proxy was co-author relationship, okay? Right. So for each journal, 
What we want to know is collectively for the set of editors, and most journals had anywhere from, oh, collectively 12 to 30 editors. Uh, I mean, you know, department editors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Who has written a paper with whom? So again, we've got 500 authors, uh, editors, I mean, and um, they've written thousands and thousands of papers. So what Laker, our student did, is he did a Google Scholar scrape. He went to Google Scholar profiles of each of the people to see who they had written papers with. And then um, we, we created a network. Now, this isn't a perfect system because, for example, each journal has like annual acknowledgement of referees and it would have those names in it. So we had to have lots of rules added so that he wasn't counting wrong things. Uh, and then, of course, there's sometimes ambiguity in names. There might be two people named James J. Smith, so then you have to you know, do other things. Yes. But anyway, he, he spent quite a lot of time in getting this code nice, uh, as good as he could, and we, we created uh, networks and network information for each of the journals. So we did two things, diversity information just demographically and network information. So that was what the analysis was. And to get to the findings, what we found out is that um, the, in terms of demographic diversity, the informs journals at the time this was as of july 2020 so a little more than a year ago there were uh, approximately 20 percent slightly under 20 percent of the journal editors were women uh, and the informs membership women is approximately 26 percent so somewhat below there were i think three individuals who would be defined as a, um, a, um, a minority by the U.S. government definition. Which is fewer than 1% of the... Yeah, so, so very few. Yeah. That was done by a manual search, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I know many of the journal editors, but also we just looked at the web page of every single person wow. to see if they fit that criteria. Wow. Anyway, so um, again, not a perfect system, but still. So, and then we found that the editors, uh, as you might expect, came from a few, in, there's a preponderance of a few institutions. The editors came from many institutions, but for each journal, we, we sort of did a histogram of which institutions. Yeah, it's specifically came. 10 institutions, which is less than 5% of the total, account for more than 25% of the editors. That's quite exactly. alarming. <laughs> exactly, and then, you know, one could argue, well, in fact, you know, those are the top institutions where research is done, where journal working as a journal editor is valued, lots of things. And there's there's an argument for that. The question is, what's the right balance? So that was about the demographic diversity. The second part, as I mentioned, was about the diversity of ideas, <laughs> again, using a proxy. But what we found out is that for some of the journals, the um, the, the network is very sparse. So a good example is Informs Journal on Applied Analytics. I don't know, there are like 12 editors or some number like that. They've written very few people's papers with each other. It's a very di diverse group of people, at least in that way. Whereas for other journals, the, uh, the network of connections is very tight. Like many of the authors have written papers with many, uh, many of the editors have written papers with many of the other editors. So uh, an example of that, I believe, was the journal Manufacturing and Service Operations Management. So we did this for each of the 16 journals, and our conclusion there was n not for every journal, but for some of the journals, there's a lot of interconnection. And is that a good thing? Um, again, you could argue that maybe it's a small field and people tend to work with each other, but you could also argue that perhaps when people see this, that the people, uh, the editors have all written papers with each other, that kind of may be sending a signal that this journal's not gonna welcome a paper from an outsider. Mm -hmm. Again, this is only suggestive, but I, I think what we found from our analysis matches what people have said anecdotally about some journals that they tend to be, they tend to seem like closed journals mm -hmm. in terms of the yeah. diversity of ideas. Yeah. And again, we, this is a proxy. We can't say for sure, but so so. But that's what we found: a a, a real variety. 
of of um, of level of interconnectedness. One thing I will say, we presented this, I presented this to the Informed Publication Board and before publishing, and I showed it to many of the journal editors. And one of the journal editors said to me, I, I saw in your paper that my journal is heavily uh, interconnected, and I know that. I inherited this editorial board, and at great personal cost, I'm slowly, slowly changing the editorial board to people who are not part of the network. So, you know, I think some journal editors are well aware of this. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so those were our findings. And then uh, we came up with some recommendations for what informs ought to do to, you know, really pay more attention to this. So the first thing is when editor in chief candidates are being considered, it's important to have a broad pool. And then for editor in chief candidates, I believe that the publication boards usually ask the editor in chief candidate to tell them what they think they would want to do with the journal. Um, and one of the things we recommend is they should also have some discussion of what they think they could do about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so that's the second recommendation. Uh, the third one is that um, when an editor is a thinking of appointing a new editorial board member, they should ask them to tell about who have, who on the editorial board have you written a paper with? And it's not to say you couldn't appoint the person. It's just useful to, to really look at that information. And then finally, the last thing we said is, you know, editors should really just keep an eye on the uh, diversity of their editorial boards over time. So those are the recommendations of our study. Mm -hmm. uh, and I might add that this paper is freely available from Informs. They've made it free to anyone who wants it. So you don't need a subscription to any Informs journal at all. Any particular motivation for publishing on service science? Um, the way that came about was I, I presented to the Informs Publication Board and Saif Benjafar, the editor of Service Science, said, I would love to publish your paper. Mm -hmm. So we sent it to that journal and got it refereed. And, went through the process and then it was published by that yeah. journal. So it was really, he just said he thought it would be a good paper to publish. Yeah, one of your recommendations uh, is related to one of the things I was thinking uh, regarding the improvement of diversity in, in the editorial boards without uh, compromising the competence. That's uh, quite of a challenge yeah. to, 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 you know, find a balance. That's always a challenge. That's why you have to be creative and thinking about uh, who might be a good candidate. You know, I've been on prize committees of informs where um, women have not won the prize very much. I'm not even going to get to minority diversity because that's even harder. But let's say let's just start with the big, you know, a, a larger pool. Okay, women haven't won this prize much. So I was on a particular prize committee and the other members of the committee had a number of very nice candidates, mostly men. And I just thought to myself, surely there is a good woman candidate I can add to this pool. And so I found a woman who was extremely distinguished who ended up getting the prize. And so I think sometimes you have to think creatively about in the same way about, well, then who could be on the editorial board? Um, you know, don't just think about so the so-called usual suspects. Yeah, right. Um, I think I speak on behalf of many colleagues and researchers from the field when it comes to have papers that's rejected in journals like Operations Research <laughs> for some arbitrary reasons. Do you think that articles from authors that are not in prestigious universities in North America or Europe or out of the club, if you will, <laughs> tend to be evaluated differently in this case? I cannot say because that was not something we studied. I mean, anecdotally, people say that, but I don't think anecdote is science. So, you know, I think one of the things in, in our editorial board paper is we really stuck to the facts. Very important to not anecdote, but facts. I mean, I mentioned there was anecdote that the journals were, were tightly connected, and in fact, the facts showed that. But so as for your question, I don't know. Now, I think an interesting follow-up study would be to look at um, who who has written the papers that are published, right? So not just look at, at the editorial board, but look at from what institutions 
are the published papers coming, right? I think that would be a very good study. I will mention that we are doing a follow-up study, not of that topic, but of, of, of our editorial board study. Uh, right now, Informs now has a 17 journals. We have, I think, Informs Journal on Data Science, I think it's called, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have 17 journals and now five of the journal editors are women. So even since last year, we've made some progress. So we're first gonna just update our analysis looking at the, the 17 informed journals to see where we've come in a year. But more than that, we are going to look at other journals that informs members publish in like production and operations management, uh, healthcare management, science, those would be examples to see how they're doing in terms of mm -hmm. diversity and networks, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so that's our follow on study, but the one you mentioned is also, I don't think we're gonna have time to do it in this study, but it's also a very worthy topic that other people have mentioned to me as well. Um, whose papers get accepted and whose papers get refereed, et cetera. And so we're probably not gonna do that in our current uh, project, but very interesting and i think so the answer the very long answer to your question <laughs> is i think we need to do a study and let the science tell us yes. what is happening yes absolutely thank you so much for for pointing that out and you know it's it's a complicated subject and uh but i think we have to talk about that right otherwise uh we won't see any changes or uh, we yes. won't be able to derive any solid conclusions if you don't study the, the problem carefully as scientists ourselves, right? Yes. Yeah. So, Margaret, uh, thank you so much for being here. I, I had a wonderful time talking to you and hearing your stories and your views. It was just amazing. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Anand. And I can only hope that in the after times, I'll have a chance to come down and visit you in Brazil. It looks lovely where you live. And uh, and by the way, that picture in my background is uh, also the before times. That's my building at Stanford with um, in the springtime with flowers in bloom. And anyway, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I'm so looking forward to, to you know, meeting you here in Brazil, maybe uh, next year or so. I don't know. Uh, but if you want to come up for a vacation or even to, to spend some time, uh, spend some quality time around, you know, uh, our city is really welcoming and uh, it's a very nice place to, to, to visit. Uh, so, Margaret, uh, take care and see you soon. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Ciao.